long um, mix of synthetic sprays in a little bit. Great. Um, well, that's really helpful information for our panelists. And um, real quick, before we also get started, I thought I would um, give a shout out to our funders. So thank you to uh, United States Department of Agriculture, BFRDP's program for funding this um, session. And our three speakers today are Andrea Satina Davis from, um, she's based in Tillman Island on the Eastern shore of Maryland with Quarter Acre Farm. We have Guy Kilpatrick with the Turp Farm at University of Maryland, and Emily Zobel, who is the extension agent in Dorchester County, um, and she's an entomologist. So she'll be talking about the uh, bugs and uh, diseases that tend to attack tomatoes. And from here, um, I thought I would also mention that at the end of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A. So if you have questions that come up during the presentations, feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll make sure that they get answered. Um, and at the end during the Q&A, I will launch one other short poll just to get some feedback from people. So please take the time to fill that out before you log off. Uh, so that's really um, it for me for now. And thank you to our panelists for taking time out of their Sundays to teach uh, this group about um, tomato trellising. So I think first we're going to turn it over to Andrea. Great. Thanks, Neve. Um, all right. Let me get this screen share going. All right. Can everyone see my hands on tomato webinar front page? Yep. And then Neve, can you give me like a five minute warning for wrap up? Yes. I'm gonna try and watch the clock, but it's a little hard. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for attending on this Sunday morning and taking time out of your um, busy spring schedule. And I'm very excited that Future Harvest invited me to speak because I really love talking about tomatoes. <laughs> so um, I'm Andre Davis Satina. I'm the farmer of Quarter Acre Farm. And I'm a first generation farmer who found their passion for agriculture back at their college's farm. Since 2001, I have eagerly learned everything I can about agriculture through classes, books, conferences, working in the field, and webinars. So I have Quarter Acre Farm, and after years of working on other people's farms, I had the chance to lease a quarter acre of land in 2008 um, out in California where I was living at the time and I jumped at the chance to start the farm. So over 10 years of operating the farm in California, the farm grew to actually be a full acre and a quarter um, in size, but I also had to move the field five times, which is not ideal. So in 2018, I moved back to Maryland in Talbot County and found a half an acre of land to lease in Tillman. And so 2019 was the first year that I was farming down here and I grew seedlings, tomatoes, and a few other crops that basically failed. Um, I also, uh, so, so, so I sold the tomatoes and seedlings at the St. Michael's Farmer's Market um, last year and to my husband who's a chef and makes prepared food um, under Quarter Acre Farm Eats and there's a lovely picture of me and my husband and some of his pico de gallo on that slide. So this year I'm growing seedlings, tomatoes, popcorn, sweet potatoes, sweet peppers, winter squash, and gourds if everything goes as planned. Um, and I'm selling at the farmer's market but I'm also doing no contact pickup in Tillman using an online shop where customers can order and pay. Um, so let's start talking about trellising. Um, some common mistakes. Uh, so the growing season is super busy. Tomato plants grow fast. So once you start trellising, it is something you will be doing weekly for a period of time. Um, so you need to kind of be prepared for that because um, you don't want the plants to get too big. 
You don't want to use stretchy or weak materials. I really try to limit my use of plastic on the farm, but I use plastic baling twine because it does not stretch. Natural twine like jute will look tight the day you do it, but then it starts to sag the next day and you don't want this. Also with stakes, if you're using natural stakes um, like made of wood, you wanna make sure that they can take being hit by a mallet. Uh, later in the season, the weight of the tomato plants will be really heavy and even more so during a wind event. So you don't want your trellis to fall over. There are many ways to trellis. I'm going to show you the style that I have developed and been using for over 10 years. So uh, just a common method uh, of using twine to re weave between tomatoes is called the Florida weave. But every farm I have ever visited that does it, does it a bit different. So it's kind of just a term like CSA, um, community supported agriculture that kind of means something different to everybody, but it's a good, a good term to know. So my tools and materials to, if you, to do my method, you'll need six foot T post, one for each end of the bed and at least one in the middle of the bed. Um, you want to consider these your anchors. They're really going to keep that uh, trellis standing up. And then in my search for sturdy stakes, I came upon electric conduit, um, which is which actually comes in 10 foot lengths, but I just cut them in half. So in this picture to the left, uh, those silver poles, that's electric conduit. Um, they're strong, but they actually don't weigh that much. Um, and so they're five foot tall and those T posts in the, po in the picture are six foot tall. You could use taller T-post if you want it, but I, I don't really feel like you need to. Um, the other materials are plastic baling twine, which I mentioned. It's the orange bundle towards the bottom of the photo. I have it wrapped around a little wooden stake because I reuse it every year. They initially um, come in like a very large spool. They're typically, you have to buy two spools at a time, um, but they can, they're, they can uh, withstand the sun rays. They're like UV protected, so they last a really long time. You're also gonna need pruners or scissors to cut the baling twine. And then you'll need a fence post driver to get the T-post in. I also use it on the electric conduit stakes, but um, you could get this, the electric conduit stakes in with um, pounding with a mallet. So those are pretty much all my tools and materials to do this. All right. One, so, quick, one quick question um, for clarification from the chat box. Um, six foot T posts, including the bottom part. So the installed oh, height is maybe 4.5 to five feet. So it's a little less than, so, so um, the six foot T post, um, it's like if you went to buy one, they're gonna measure the T post based on the entire length of it. And if you look in this picture here towards the bottom, you see the rusty kind of dirty part um, where there is um, a plate. I'm not sure exactly what that is called, but it's like a little winged plate on the bottom. I pound that into the ground just to cover that plate. So that is maybe a foot, not even a foot in the ground. So they are, um, you know, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but she did say that she's got it now. Thanks. One other quick question. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what do you use to cut the conduit? Okay, so there's a couple different things that you can use to do it. And I have used many different things. One, try to get the store to cut it. They will probably 90% of the time tell you no, they can't cut it. But every now and then you get someone at uh, the hardware store or the box store that goes, oh, sure, we can cut them in half try it. That's the best idea. The other thing is um, it's not actually that thick. It's hollow on the inside. So there is um, just like saws that are meant to, um, to cut the metal that you can use. And those, um, I've used those a bunch of times, but you do have to like hold on to it so it doesn't roll. 
And then the other tool, which is literally, it's like a pipe cutter that um, you turn it to go like a, it's like a little, it fits in your hand. It's the size of your hand. And you kind of clamp it around the pipe and you turn it around a bunch of times and it cuts it. So again, if you're in the hardware store or the big box store and um, you ask them to cut it and they won't, or you can just ask them, what do I need to cut electric conduit? It doesn't take a lot, but it is, I mean, it is a little time consuming. You'll, you know, want to, you know, it's not, I, I can, I can do it. You know, I got my like 12 year old nephew to do it at one point. Like you, it, it's not that difficult. It just takes a while to get them cut. But then once they're cut, um, you have them forever. Um, so I think that's good. Okay. So let's get into getting the materials out in the field. So step one on the left, you're gonna pound in one T post on each end of the bed in a line with a plant. In this picture here, um, there are two beds of tomatoes covered in straw. It's, I know it's a little unclear to see. So the, um, you wanna line up the T post as best you can with the tomato plant, just eyeball it, take the, um, the fence um, driver, and pound those in. And then you are going to take uh, your electric conduit stakes or other sturdy stakes, and you're going to put those, um, oh, I'm sorry. So the T post, you're gonna do them on the end, and then you're gonna put one T post or two T post in the middle of the bed. So my beds are currently 130 feet long. That is a little, long to only use one T post in the middle. So I use two evenly spaced. I just eyeball it. I don't actually measure it. Um, if my beds were only a hundred foot long, I would just use one T post in the center. Okay. Again, these are going to be the anchors to your system. You want to make sure that they are very sturdy. I have clay soil. Um, if I had sandy soil, I might put the T post lower into the ground. But as I said before, I just pound them in so that that um, winged plate is below the ground. So you got your T post in. Next picture on the right, you're going to get your stakes in. So I put these stakes every two plants. Um, approximately. If I come up against a T post and there's three plants left, I'm just going to put in one stake in between. That, that's okay occasionally, but you want to aim to have um, an electric conduit, two plants, electric conduit, two plants going down the line. Um, like I said, you can, you can um, put these in um, with a mallet, but because I have the, pen, the fence post driver, I just pound them in just twice. And so they sink, um, making them less than five feet. You know, they're probably four to four and a half feet tall. These, you wanna make sure they're sturdy in the ground, but they're really, their job is to hold the twine. They're not, they're not the anchors. Okay, so you're gonna go through and get those done and then ta-da! You have all of your T post in, you have all your electric conduit in. This is a picture of my field this spring from a couple weeks ago. I will talk about the mulch situation um, later. So here's an approximate cost of the materials. This does not include the tomato plants. This does not include irrigation or my labor. So I pulled these numbers from like the current cost of things. So these are like, if you went on to uh, a tra uh, tractor supply right now to buy a six foot post, that is what it's going to cost you. Um, so for one bed, I used four six foot posts. They're three sixty nine dollars each. Um, I used approximately 26 five foot electric conduit stakes. Now, at $2.77, that is for each one because I cut them in half. But like I said earlier, you're going to end up buying a 10 foot piece of electric conduit. Um, and then the baling twine, um, that the uh, 780 feet worth of baling twine 
that is for tying three times on um, uh, my 130 foot row. Um, and then I also included the cost of straw. So I used three bales of straw for um, a bed of tomatoes. So the cost might seem a little high for, for some people, but the thing is, the only thing you'll have to purchase again next year is the straw. I have literally used the same baling twine since 2010. I haven't even finished the second spool yet. And that's because it really doesn't break down because it's made of plastic. And at the end of the season, I cut the, um, the twine off the bed and I roll it up on that wooden stake that you kind of saw in that picture making a spool. And then to reuse it, if I'm, you know, going down the line and I run out of the, the um, twine, I just knot a new piece on and I keep going. So it's really, um, you know, usable from year to year. All right, so now let's get into the tying method. And this is kind of hard to explain. This is the part that it's too bad we're not hands-on because it's a little hard to, to, I feel like, explain it in words. Um, so in this picture, the twine is like a peach color, so it's a little hard to see. So I doodled on top of the, it's there, the twine is there, but I doodled on top of the picture to, in the red to try to make it a little clear. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna securely tie your twine to the T-post at the end of the bed, about six inches or so above the ground. This is for the first time that you're, you're um, tying. So I took these photos a, few, uh, a little while ago and the plants are uh, a wee bit too small. So you want your plants to really be about 12 inches tall before you start this whole endeavor because you need to have something to trellis. So once your twine is securely attached to the T-post, you will run the twine on one side of the tomato plants. When you get to the electric conduit stake, you're going to tightly loop it around. I have to stress, it is very important that you make sure it is tight at each stake. You don't want any slack. It should be tight like a guitar string. You're just, you're gonna yank on that, you're gonna make it really taunt, and you're gonna hold that tension. Um, after it is tightly looped around the stake, you will run the twine down the next two tomato plants, but on the opposite side. So you are zigzagging down the field with twine running the twine from one side to the next until you reach the end of the bed. Okay. So once you get to the end of the bed, you're gonna tightly wrap the twine twice around the T-post at the very end, and then you're gonna head back down the bed. This time the twine is running on the opposite side of the tomatoes and you are tightly looping around the stakes just as before. So in my lovely doodle picture here on the left, you have the red mark showing like the first passing of the twine and the blue line showing the second one. So you are really, um, you know, creating a, like a, a sandwiching effect. So when you get back to the first T post, the twine um, you're going to wrap it twice around the T-post. You're going to leave about six inches or so, and you're going to cut it, and you're going to tie a nice tight knot. And at that point, your first trellis is complete, and now your tomatoes should be standing straight up between two lines of twine. So I feel like that picture is a little clearer, even though that the twine um, is peach color against the straw. Um, but you will have to do this again when the tomatoes have grown another 12 inches or so. So that's going to be about every week um, until you reach the top of the stakes. Uh, so it'll probably be like three times for each bed, maybe four, but I have to give you a little full disclosure here that most years I get pretty busy and I only manage to tie some of the rows twice. Not ideal. That's reality, but even those two 
times that I've tied it are going to be super helpful in containing the plant, making harvest easier, uh, you know, limit, uh, increasing airflow. So it's, it's good to, to do it um, even if you don't think you're going to be able to do it till you reach the top of the stakes. Okay, so some considerations about things that I do. So I use drip tape for irrigation and as my measurement tape to space my tomatoes 24 inches apart because my drip tape has emitters every eight inches. So all of my spacing is divisible by eight. <laughs> um, when putting the stakes in, I have to be mindful not to stab the drip tape. So it's a thing, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, I do three plantings of cherry and heirloom tomatoes so that I have a steady supply um, once harvest starts in mid-July until the frost in October. I grow mainly open pollinated tomatoes, but I have been testing out um, three grafted tomato varieties, Brandywine, Striped German, and um, German Johnson. I'm also growing the same of those three varieties non-grafted to be able to compare. Um, last year, I have to say that the non-grafted outperformed the grafted tomatoes, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so you can see in the picture that I do some mulching. Um, in the straw beds, what I've been doing is using straw with two sheets worth of newspaper under the straw, just kind of around the tomato plants. This just helps to limit the weeds. And then this year, I'm trying out paper mulch. but I, but in the week or two that it's been in, I have to say uh, it's not winning the experiment. It's ripped severely from when it goes from wet to dry. It, it like stresses and rips when it's drying. So I will be covering those beds with straw to keep the paper mulch from ripping off and flying away, which I had to go and fix this morning. Um, with my uh, tomato variety selection, uh, this year I'm growing uh, 10 different cherries and 18 different um, slicing tomato, heirloom tomatoes, plus those three grafted varieties. I only use certified organic seed um, and I base my selection on my market. So for my husband's food business, he's looking for meaty, low water content tomatoes that are mainly red. So I'm looking to, you know, find tomatoes that fit that. And then for my farmer's market customers, I want a variety of colors. I want fruits that are around one pound in size. I know I, and I need tomatoes that taste great on sandwiches or in salads because that's what my customers want. So some resources. So this is where I get my supplies, electric conduit. I happen to get those at Lowe's, but you can get them at any big box store or a hardware store. The baling twine, you can order it online. It weighs a ton, so you get end up being charged a lot for shipping. I bought mine 10 years ago at a feed supply store, um, and they'll just you know get it shipped. Or a place that you might buy straw, they're gonna have baling twine, and they can just get it for you. It's actually pretty inexpensive. T-Post, got them at Tractor Supply. They also had the fence drivers. You can get T-Post other places. They just had the best price. Tomato seeds, those are the seed companies that I use, Fedco, High Mowing, and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. The grafted tomato plants I'm playing around with, they came from Johnny's. Um, I've learned uh, how to grow tomato techniques mainly through hands-on experience and working on other people's farms, but these books that I listed have been really helpful on my tomato journey, and they are on my shelf and I do reference them in the off season when I'm making more plans or adjustments. And this is how you can get in contact with me um, as you're growing your tomatoes. If you have any questions, please reach out. I'd be happy to try and troubleshoot with you. I really believe that there's no point in information if everyone does not have access to it. So anything that I've learned, I'm more than happy to pass it on. So you can just email me. So that's it.
Sweet, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and I'm sure people will be asking whether or not the slides will be available. Yes, already somebody asked. Cool, definitely. So um, the recording of this and the slides will be made available on Future Harvest's website. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about COVID is that it, while certain things would be better to do in person, one of the silver linings is that we're able to do these online and record them and make everything available to a wider audience. So on our website, we have a, a tab called resources. And if you look under that tab, um, that's where we put all of our webinar recordings. So this will be there with slides from all of the presenters. Um, and I'll also email it to you. So after every session, I email the slides and um, uh, recordings to people. Um, and so I, um, and two things I wanted to say real quick before we turn it over to Guy. Um, I'm off, I think it's awesome to see people are, are doing stuff in the chat box. So keep on sharing resources and information because, you know, you, you live in different locations and you can share where you get things. Um, and, uh, and then I'm keeping track of some of the questions that are coming up so we can do that at the end. Want to make sure that we have time to get through everything. Cool, so thanks again, Andrea, and we'll turn over to Guy. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna share the screen now. Okay. There we go. Everyone see that okay? It's showing up? Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, going to talk about how we do high tunnel tomato trellising um, at the Turp Farm, the University of Maryland Turp Farm. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, a high tunnel is similar to a greenhouse. It's a protected growing environment, um, you know, sort of like a frame with a plastic or glass cover over it. Um, and it's a really good environment to grow tomatoes in because um, you can uh, prevent rain from hitting the soil and splashing particles containing diseases up onto the leaves. And you can also uh, control soil moisture uh, much more uh, accurately. So um, tomatoes thrive in high tunnels. All right, so a little background on Turp Farm. Uh, Turp Farm is a vegetable production farm um, operated by the Department of Dining Services at University of Maryland College Park. Dining services at University of Maryland is an in-house program. Um, it is not a, uh, a contracted food service. Um, the farm, though, is not located directly on campus. It's at the Central Maryland Research and Education Center Upper Marlboro facility, which is um, about halfway between downtown Upper Marlboro and Largo in Prince George's County. And this will be our seventh season in operation. Uh, the farm footprint itself um, occupies approximately three and a quarter acres, a quarter acre of that being in, in high tunnel production. If you look at this panorama of the farm, you can see where our field production is taking up most of the photo. And then, and then over to the left of the photo, you can, you can see the high tunnels. Um, so we, uh, for the last four seasons have grown tomatoes only in the high tunnels and we use about 2,000 square feet per season, um, which is essentially one tunnel. Um, okay, so the scenario that we um, are looking at with, uh, with our, our uh, particular production system is that our tomatoes are trellised using a top line um, method and, and that Essentially what that means is that there's a, we, we, sh we run wires across the top of the tunnel uh, above each row, and then we hang the twine from the wire and support the tomato from, uh, basically it's like a vertical trellis. Um, so the plants are spaced 18 inches in the rows and they're supported by that single line. Um, plants are pruned to a single leader, meaning that we don't allow any of the side shoots um, that, that grow out of the side of the, of the um, main growing stem to um, we pinch all of those out. So the leaves, we also aggressively prune leaves to promote optimal airflow and uh, plant hygiene. Since it is a confined environment, even though we are able to prevent rain from um, 
contacting the plants. It is the mid-Atlantic. It does get quite humid and, um, and that can promote disease. Um, so by increasing airflow, we can cut down on that. Um, and then one of the advantages of the top line system is that we don't have to um, uh, top out the plants, meaning we're, we're not gonna control the height of the plants by cutting them back. Instead, we actually lower the, the plants down by doling out extra twine. Um, so the plants can grow, I mean, in some in perfect conditions, like if you had a heated greenhouse, you know, you could grow on your plants for a year if you wanted to, and they could be 30, 40 feet long in the end. Ours, uh, because it's an unheated space, you know, they, they winter kill pretty early. Um, I think the longest our plants have ever gotten is about 20 feet. Um, but this also, this system also allows you to lower where the fruiting clusters are, lower them down to a comfortable harvesting height so you don't have to use a, a ladder or anything to get to them. So here's a, a, a image of what this tunnel looks like when it's full of plants. And it's a little hard to see because of the, um, the light, but you can kind of if you look where the arrows are. You can kind of see where those wires are running and they have uh, hooks that contain the twine. And then um, it's kind of faint to see, but you can see the lines dropping down and the tomatoes are clipped to that. This, in this picture, this is um, from a couple years ago, we used to do um, two liters um, and it got a little bit wild. Uh, and I since switched to doing single liter pruning, which um, keeps things much more in control. So one interesting or uncommon thing about our system is that our bed, it has to do with our bed layout. So like typically beds are um, in most scenarios that I've seen uh, run the length of the tunnel, um, which I call longitudinally. In our case, we arrange the beds laterally. Um, so they're parallel to the ends of the tunnel. Um, and we space those beds 60 inches on center. And then we actually put two rows of tomatoes on each bed. Um, since our tunnel has roll-up sides for ventilation, we found this layout allows for much greater airflow between the plants, um, shorter rows with wider spacing essentially. Um, and so the air just moves right, right between the plants very easily. Um, this layout also interestingly means we can achieve a greater density of our planting while um, also having that wide spacing contributes to easier maintenance and harvesting. Um, so here's a diagram of, of what I mean, uh, showing the difference between lateral and longitudinal. We, uh, we leave about eight feet of, of not uncultivated ground on each end of the greenhouse or high tunnel and then a walking path along the two sides. So the beds are actually, the, the tunnel's 30 feet wide, but the beds are only 25 feet long. Um, and then they're 80 feet. Um, we are planting them on about 80 feet of space. Um, so as you can see, two rows per bed on the 60 inch centers with 18 inches between the plants, we get about 33 plants per bed and approximately 396 or 400 plants in a planting. When we use the longitudinal syst uh, system, uh, it's far fewer beds, six beds on um, that 80 foot length. Um, the beds are narrower, so 36 inch bed centers, which means we only put one row of tomatoes on a bed. Again, with 18 inch spacing between plants, we get 53 plants per bed, which is actually 320, so. And again, narrower spacing between rows, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're not keeping up with pruning. So how do we do propagation? We start seeds in what I call drill trays. Um, you can get these trays in 10 or 20 row versions. Um, I find that this just makes seeding a lot easier. I don't have to like singulate seed into individual cells. Um, and I've also have a hunch that tomatoes prefer dense seeding for germination. If you've ever uh, noticed like a year after planting tomatoes, if any tomatoes have fallen and dropped to the ground, 
they seem to germinate very readily. Um, and I think it's because they're in a cluster. <laughs> Uh, whereas when I've singulated seed into cells, sometimes I get like uh, spotty germination. But when I do this system, you know, I'm seeding far more than I actually need for the planting. And it guarantees that I have enough seedlings for planting. Um, this also um, saves space on a heat map or in a germination chamber um, because you can get like a thousand seeds in one tray versus many trays. So then I prick out or pot up those seedlings after they've germinated to the trays that they're going to be in until transplanting. And in, in our case, 50 cell trays. So I do that at the first sign of true leaves. Um, I have, there's an image of, of uh, the pricking out process. Um, and I use a dibble or a widger, which is just like basically a modified spoon to, to actually open up a little space for the, you know, pre-fill the, tr the trays with soil mix and then I open up a little space and drop that seedling in and cover it up. And you can actually put them in to the full depth of the plant with just the leaves showing um, so that, you know, that prevents damping off, but also um, tomatoes like to root adventitiously from anywhere that the stem is in contact with soil. So they actually perform quite well like that. Um, and then again, this allows me to get an exact count for the desired number of transplants that I need. Um, so growing on, um, we grow on those seedlings in the 50 cell trays for several weeks until the plants um, begin to get a little bit leggy, say 10 to 15 inches tall. Um, I'm applying foliar fertilizer or drenching the trays with, with a fertilizer. We use a liquefied fish emulsion um, solution. Um, and I do that on a bi-weekly basis. Um, and then I also am checking to ensure that <clears throat> no, no suckers or side shoots are forming. I pinch those out as soon as I see them and any premature blossoms, um, but just be careful not to pr pinch that primary leader or, or the plants will start to branch. Um, and uh, I'm not always um, that diligent about this, but rotating trays and spacing them out um, can help ensure even growth rates. Like in, um, in a greenhouse, you know, there's often like little shadows and things like that, that kind of like start to create uneven growth rates within a tray. So just literally just like changing position of the trays can help um, even things out a little bit. And then I'm constantly scouting for pests and implementing controls as needed. Um, I will say that when planting from a greenhouse situation into a high tunnel situation as opposed to outside, there really isn't a need to harden off the tomato plants, meaning we don't have to put them outside during the day to kind of like get them used to those conditions because the conditions in the high tunnel are basically the same as the conditions in the greenhouse. Plus they're not as exposed to wind and things like that. So when transplanting, um, I'm sure, I always make sure to plant to moisture. What that means is I will um, pre-irrigate the beds a day or two in advance of planting so that there's moisture deep in the soil. And then I ensure that the root ball, the bottom of the root ball of the transplant is well within that moisture zone. So that could be anywhere from six to 12 inches deep, depending on how deep your tillage zone was. Um, and then I leave, I, I try to leave just like the top few sets of leaves uh, above the soil surface in the same way that I recommended um, when you're doing the pricking out process of, of dropping your seedlings in deep into the cell tray. The same, um, the same thing applies when you're transplanting into the actual soil. So I remove leaves from the side all the way up the stem from the root ball up to like the, the top couple sets of leaves and get them in deep. And this is really important thing to do, getting that depth in a high tunnel situation because it's a dry environment, right? So you want the roots to be as deep as they can possibly be. Um, so, and, and, but there, there, it is also, I mean, I've seen this done before. If you don't have very deep tillage zone and you do have long spindly plants, you can actually like kind of trench where the row is going to go and then lay the plants in and then just kind of bend the top part of the plant up um, 
that's going to be above the soil surface and kind of it's called towing towing them in. Um, I don't recommend it, but you can do it. It works. Um, so I'm spacing plants. You want to space the plants at least 12 inches, preferably 18 inches between um, the plants in the row. Um, so you can go with like that density of planting when you're doing this single row or single leader system because the plants are very narrow. And in our case, we do plant double rows on the single bed. So I stagger those two rows so that there's an even space between all the plants um, with at least six, preferably 12 inches between those rows. Um, and then I prefer to plant on 60 inch centers, but I'd say anywhere from 48 to 60 inches so that you have room to work, especially with pruning and harvesting. Um, and then that also, in our case, leaves room for companion planting. Usually I plant a crop, a quick crop of basil at the same time that I'm transplanting the tomatoes. And within a few weeks of planting, I'm harvesting out the basil, leaving the tomatoes in place, and then proceeding with mulching. Um, so here's like an early picture of of what that looks like, the two rows of tomatoes. Um, and then the in this case, I believe that's Swiss chard, which um, we tried as a companion plant. Um, uh, anyway, those companion plants are, rows are spaced on like 30 inch centers. But essentially it's just on either side of the bed, the walkway in the middle. So at the when it comes to trellising, at the time of planting, we do we run the string down and we place a single um, tomato clip just below the top set of leaves, and that's just to keep the the um, twine organized, so it's not like blowing around and getting knotted and things like that. But it's at that point, it's not really doing anything to support the plant. Um, but as the plants grow, we're going to continue to prune off leaves that are touching the ground, which is a vector for disease, or um, any leaves that are already diseased certainly need to be removed and um, take, actually removed from the tunnel. Don't just drop them on the ground. Um, there's a lot of sucker pinching. Those are the side shoots that would eventually turn into additional branches, which we don't want. So constantly getting in there and pinching those suckers off. And then we're keeping the plants to one or two liters. I prefer one, as I said, to encourage that upward vigor and reduce the likelihood that the plant will revert to a bushier habit. Um, and definitely you need to be doing this on a weekly, if not twice a week basis, or you'll start the plants grow so fast, you will start to have a mess on your hands. The work is a lot easier when you do it more frequently. Um, and then we continue to add those support clips as the plants gain height. These clips should be placed below good structural leaves with a little bit of tension on the string. That's what's going to support the plant. And here's a picture of what that looks like. So you can purchase these clips. The, the hinge of the clip actually grips the twine. And then when you close the clip, it's, it's loose around the stem, so it's not girdling the stem. But as you can see where this clip is being placed, it's right below that support, that structural branch. And so the, the, the plant is going to kind of like be held up by the clip in that way. So when we get to fruit production, um, continue pinching um, any new flowers immediately after transplanting up to the desired height of the first fruit set. So like you might not want fruit set that's like two inches off the ground. So I usually wait until they're about eight, the plants are about 18 inches high. And that's when I start allowing flowers to, to turn into fruit. Um, now you're also going to be pruning off leaves, especially, you know, up to about that height. Um, to allow for that maximum airflow and prevent any, you know, above that height, leaves generally aren't going to touch the ground. Uh, but even if you're pruning off all the leaves and you have like a fruit set at the height that's desirable, you're going to want to, you're going to want to leave that there. Don't, you know, cut that off by accident. I call those fruiting hooks. Once the harvest, the fruit has been harvested off the fruiting hooks, though, you can go ahead and prune that off. Um, 
So as the harvestable fruit begins to rise to levels that are uncomfortable or inefficient for harvesting, um, consider lowering the plants to bring the fruit, uh, fruit sets down. It would be really hard for me to describe how to do the lower and lean system, and it isn't actually necessary in order to grow tomatoes this way. It's just kind of convenient and really only um, applicable in like commercial production situations. Um, I'm going to let Johnny Selected Seeds describe it for you because they produced a really nice video tutorial on this technique and I've included the link here in the, um, in the presentation. But basically this allows the plants to continue that growth, that upward growth, um, but you know, preventing them from extending well above the trellis support wire and again, um, you know, at a, placing the fruit sets at a range where you can't reach them just by walking through. So here is a more recent picture of the tomato, the tomatoes in the tunnel. And this student worker, Jack, is actually about six and a half feet tall. So you can see really how tall these plants get. Um, and, and he's been doing a great job of keeping the tomatoes nicely pruned. You can see what, what I mean with the lower portions of the plant, we're really skeletonizing those stems and no leaves are touching the ground. Um, also note that at this point, you know, these plants have probably been in the ground for four to six weeks. Um, there are, we've already long ago harvested that companion crop. So now it's just the tomatoes left in the tunnel. Um, and this, particular crop has a ground cover of straw mulch. We did experiment with, you know, one of the issues with just using straw mulch is anything that drops to the ground tends to like, you know, rot there. And we would find that tomatoes become a weed in the salad mix that we plant in there in the spring. So we're trying to find ways to prevent that from happening. We experimented with using row cover to kind of like catch the debris. Um, it didn't really work that well. <laughs> So now I'm just much more fastidious about when we're harvest or when we're pruning or harvesting or doing anything like that. We remove everything as best that we can from the tunnel. We don't let anything stay on the ground. Um, and then we put that all in the compost pile. So some other considerations about high tunnel grown tomatoes. Obviously, when it comes to fertility, you need to order a soil test. Um, they're good for two to three years. Um, extension, the University of Maryland Extension produces vegetable production recommendations. It's like a giant book of recommendations, but you can get the PDF online. It'll tell you what is recommended for growing tomatoes in the mid-Atlantic. So you can get your target pH and then make determinations about what fertilizers you might need to add to hit your macro and micronutrient recommendations. In particular, tomatoes are especially affected by boron and calcium deficiencies. Um, boron deficiencies usually result in what's called cat facing, which is like the, um, it, it, I guess it has something to do with the blossoms, but like it causes those like um, crusty streaks that are on the back of it that looks like a cat face. I don't, it's an interesting term, but, and then calcium deficiencies lead to things like blossom end rot and, um, you know, basically it just affects the quality of your fruit. Um, for pest and disease management, um, insect pests, Lepidoptera are a big problem. Those are like any, like worms and caterpillars. Um, we struggle with hornworm and armyworm. Um, we also, later in the season when, when it starts to cool off a little bit at night and we start getting like, um, you know, some fruit that's rotting on the vine, we then start to see a surge of white flies and fungus gnats and they're really obnoxious. But the best way to, to compete with that is uh, hygiene. Just keep the plants clean, remove rotten fruit, everything. Um, and then we control lep the, the worms primarily with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. So, um, for diseases, you know, high tunnel tomatoes are susceptible to all the same diseases that, that outdoor tomatoes will be, but there's less prevalence of it because you're preventing that soil splashing um, by keeping them under cover. Um, 
but there is an IPM, the home, uh, again, University of Maryland Extension Home Garden Information Center has a really good integrated pest management guide um, and the link is there. That'll uh, help you diagnose and treat problems. Um, I also want to mention the, the most clever way that we have found for controlling hornworms. And again, this is a small planting. It's only 2,000 square feet of space. Um, it's like twice the size of a house, maybe. Um, we actually go into the tunnel at night with a flashlight that it has like, um, it's like a UV flashlight, kind of like a black light. Um, and when you shine it on the plants, the plants appear purple, but the hornworms, which are bright green in the daylight, they actually like glow like a glow stick. And so it's really easy to identify them. And hornworms don't usually come in in huge populations, but each one does a huge amount of damage. But if you do this like on a, on a nightly basis, as soon as you first spot, start spotting hornworms, you can get almost perfect control pretty quickly. And I imagine this would also work for outdoor tomatoes. Um, otherwise, they're really hard to spot even during the day. They blend in very well with the foliage. So when it comes to irrigation, um, I am, have been talking about prohibiting soil splashing as a main way to control disease. Um, so I definitely recommend using trickle irrigation. Uh, we use drip tape, basically. Um, you could maybe, if you were doing this in a home situation, you could use like soaker hose or just hand watering, but trying to do it in a way that prevents soil splashing. So a gentle watering at each plant. Um, you do want to irrigate to the full depth, like as I said, with planting to moisture. So when you irrigate, irrigate deep, but don't do it so frequently that the plant decides it doesn't need to go and send its roots down very deep. The deeper the rooting, the uh, less irrigation you're going to have to provide for the plant. Plus, even though tomatoes are heat loving plants, their roots are sensitive to heat in the soil. So the deeper the roots go, the more access to cool soil it'll have and the healthier plant you'll have. And I'll also say that um, when you uh, minimize irrigation as much as possible, you actually wind up getting sweeter fruit because the tomatoes are less watery. And I would also suggest waiting to irrigate until after harvesting if you've got a big harvest coming up because you can potentially split the fruit um, or cause the fruit to split when the plant takes up water. With mulching options, as I said, we use straw mulch primarily um, because it's easy to put down and easy to remove. Um, I uh, wait to apply the straw mulch until I've weeded the beds a few times. Um, you know, like a quick surface hoeing just to like remove any potential weeds and then apply the straw mulch and we get really great weed control that way. You can also use woven fabric um, ground cover, you know, with like holes punched in it or burned in it, which um, would really help with this, the hygiene aspect that I talked about, like with like drops and things like that and like fruit not getting into the soil. But um, I think it's a little bit more effort to put it down and then pull it up every year. So I haven't gone there. And it's plastic. You know, if you're concerned about using plastic on your farm, you know, just go with the organic option, straw mulch. You don't necessarily have to use mulch. I mean, if you're diligent about weeding, you can get that same level of weed control. But again, as I mentioned, like having something to cool the soil a little bit so that the roots aren't overheating um, can help with the health of the plant. With other um, uh, some other considerations here talking about variety selection. Um, we specifically have settled on using a variety called Clementine, which is a cocktail tomato. It's about the size of a golf ball. Um, it's orange. It's got a um, really good um, harvest quality, like zero splits. Um, it holds for a long time in storage. Our chefs love it. They're easy to process. I mean, there's just a lot of benefits with that variety. But, you know, I just encourage you to go through seed catalogs and, and explore and see what they got. You do want to choose for this system, you want to choose indeterminate varieties, meaning they will continue to grow and flower for an indeterminate amount of time. They set more than one fruit set. 
um, and then also like in the Johnny's catalog, um, they actually have a whole section called greenhouse performers. So that's a good place to look for growing high tunnel tomatoes. If you look on the right here at the germination guide, this is an example of a germination guide from Johnny Selected Seeds. It actually, down at the bottom with product features, it has a little symbol of a greenhouse that denotes that it's a greenhouse performer. Um, so typically you're gonna, these greenhouse performers are gonna have a vining habit to begin with, um, meaning they're gonna have a lot of upward vigor. Um, and then if you have concerns about diseases, a lot of these varieties, especially the hybrid varieties have been developed with specific d disease resistances um, in mind and the codes in this particular catalog are, are there to indicate that. I will say when selecting a variety for this particular system, um, you do wanna consider fruit weight because if, the, um, if you're growing something like a beefsteak tomato, it's probably gonna not perform well um, considering the weight of the fruit, you know, hanging from these strings. So we use typically smaller fruiting varieties Cherry tomatoes are a good call. The cocktail tomatoes, um, maybe Roma tomatoes, but uh, I would stay away from the super big ones. Um, and then, I you know I mentioned some of the tools we use, so I'll just go to the next slide. And here's you know all of these you can buy from Johnny Selected Seeds. The different propagation trays. We use a hands-free pruner for pruning because then I can clip and prune at the same time, and like I have access to both of my hands instead of having to like put the pruners away and pull them back out and put them away and pull them back out. We use these hollow leg bags, it basically attaches to your hip. Um, it's just really convenient so I don't have to carry around a bucket or anything and I can, just, I can have one bag, the smaller bag has clips in it and the larger bag is where I'm putting my pruning, everything I've pruned off. Um, you can buy the vine clips. Um, we use we also use plastic tomato twine. Um, it's not Baylor's twine because we don't need something that's as heavy duty for this particular system. Um, but you, you know, the plastic twine, it doesn't rot and it doesn't promote disease the way that um, natural fiber twines do. And then the twine is actually connected or wrapped around either a roller hook or a tomahawk. We use the tomahawks at Turf Farm because they're cheaper. Um, but that's what actually allows the twine to attach to the, to the overhead wire. You're not tying it to the overhead wire. You actually want that extra amount of string, especially if you're doing lean and lower, because that's how you're going to dole out extra strength in order to lay the plants down. So there it is. Um, any questions? I will warn you that my first answer will be, it depends. Awesome guy, that was so great. Um, thank you so much. And we have tons of questions actually coming in. Um, but I want to also make sure that there's um, time for a quick bathroom break before we dive into the next presentation. Um, so I've actually been keeping a running list of all the questions and they're really, really good ones. So I wanna make sure we have time to get to all of them. So what I'm gonna propose is that we take a five minute, maybe a seven minute break. And um, when we come back, we will have about 15 minutes of presentation from Emily Zobel, who is um, an extension specialist and she focuses on pests and disease. And so she'll be talking about the types of pests and diseases that attack tomatoes uh, so that we have a little bit of time to talk through that. And then we'll have the rest of the time to go through these really great questions that are coming up. Um, so let's go ahead and um, meet back at 12.10 um, and pick it up from there. So um, thank you, Guy, and we'll be back uh, shortly. Do you want me to start back? Uh, now is good to go. Now is good. Okay, awesome. So thank you guys so much uh, for tuning in for the second half of this. This is going to be a little less production focused and a little bit more scouting um, and kind of problem solving. So now that you've decided to grow tomatoes and you figured out, you know, you've staked them, you've chalice them, it's in the growing season and you're getting all these tomatoes and they're not good. So what is causing that and where do you go from there is kind of what I'm going to touch on. 
Um, my email is listed here. You can feel free to email me any questions you have or any pictures of any uh, pests or diseases, and I can always try to help you. If you have a field here on the Eastern Shore, I'm also more than willing to come out and visit it. Um, we'll have to engage in social distancing for safety protocols, but uh, I'm, I'm available. You can also reach out to your local extension office to see if their agent is available to help you as well. We're basically in every county in Maryland. And for those of you who are not in Maryland, University of Delaware or Virginia Tech or whatever your state institute is should have an extension office in your county or in a nearby county. So I'm going to start off by saying there are a lot of diseases and things that will eat tomatoes. They are very yummy. That's why we all want to grow them because people like to eat them. So I'm going to start off with my resources right off the bat. I can send around these resources to people. I highly recommend the Mid-Atlantic Commercial Vegetable Production Guide. Well, for those of you who are doing organic, it does focus a little bit more on listing out kind of like the chemicals that you can use. They do have some organic stuff in there, but it's really also good because it'll talk about things like spacing and pruning and post-harvest cleaning and that kind of stuff. Um, it is free as well, or you can buy a book version. I think they run anywhere from about 20 to $30. Um, University of Maryland Extension has some great resources. You can also do things like Clemens uh, and NC State have some great resources as well. I would just take them and other states that are not in the Mid-Atlantic with a little bit of grain of salt because they might, while they're gonna have the same issues, they may not have them to the same magnitude that we do. Particularly like UC Davis has some great tomato resources, but their diseases are really different from the ones that we get here in the Mid-Atlantic because we're humid and they're hot. So they'll have some great information there, but just note that when they say like, this is the most common one, they're talking about California and not Maryland. So by all means, check them out, uh, but just kind of always relate back to kind of the area that you are. And it's not like bugs go up to a state line and say, oh wait, I don't really wanna go into tax-free shopping in Delaware, so I'm gonna stay in Maryland. So, you know, insects, it's a little bit more giving. I also am gonna pitch this Penn State Vegetable Integrated Pest Management with emphasis on biocontrol. This just came out and I absolutely love this guide. It's I think 20 to $30 again, but it's in color. It's got some great pictures and particularly for those of you who are doing mixed vegetable production, I highly recommend it. So when I'm talking about pest management, I do wanna emphasize that we're gonna take into consideration an integrated approach. Um, if you've never heard of integrated pest management, I've given talks for Future Harvest on it before. I also have a great women in ag one that's up on YouTube. If you wanna to link to it, just shoot me an email and I will send it to you. Um, particularly if you're a new farmer, I would take the time to learn this because ideally, even if you are an organic farmer, if you're out there spraying every single day, even if it's an organic chemical, that's still one, not financially economical for you. And two, that's not very environmentally friendly. So the idea behind integrated pest management is that we do a lot of the stuff on the bottom of this pyramid. Get my laser pointer. So a lot of things like prevention, cultural and sanitation practices, and physical ones, and very little of this chemical, if all possible. We do rely on biological control, but in all reality, um, biological control is only going to control a pest about 10 to 20 percent of the time, and only knock the population down about 10 to 20 percent what you're seeing. So it's great to keep it like under a threshold, but if you have a major outbreak, um, you may not, like trying to get biocontrol in to take care of an outbreak is not always gonna work because there's always a lag feel to it. And I will say this year in particular, we have not seen our natural enemies and predators catch up to our pests. Like our wonky kind of spring has definitely delayed them a little bit. When you are engaging in this, you do want to do scouting and something like tomatoes is really easy to scout in because the majority of the time you're in them every single day. It's not like a field crop where you kind of plant it and leave it and come back like, you know, a month later. Most people who grow tomatoes are walking their tomatoes or are harvesting them, if not daily, every two or three days or so. Depending on the size of your field. Um, you want to always scout 10 plants in about five to eight locations in either your field, field or your greenhouse. So for something like guys, I probably wouldn't necessarily scout 80 plants because that's 
probably what a fourth of your plants or something like that you might only do 50 but I tend to say somewhere about five to ten percent of your plants and you want to do them not all in the same location so throughout the field uh, borders in the middle hedgerows and so forth okay so I'm going to try to make this a little bit more interactive and this may drag on a little long to the point where I don't get through all of these. So uh, when my time is up, go ahead and cut me. But what I want you guys to do is use the chat box to answer what you think is causing the damage. So in this case, what do you think is causing the damage? And by the damage, I mean these yellow kind of bursts here. Like I know this one has some brown dead leaves, but tomato plants naturally as they get older will have some dead leaves coming up. Um, and, and don't worry about that. Like you, at some point if like half of them are dead or if they're dead up at the top, you need to worry, but the bottom leaves will naturally turn brown and die if you don't prune them. So I'm talking specifically about this kind of stuff. So what do you guys think is causing this damage? Okay, so we've got minerals, sun damage, stink bug, fungal raid virus, boron. Okay, so uh, you guys guessed it, or someone sort of guessed it. So this is not actually a mineral deficiency. This is caused by stink bugs. So stink bugs are a type of true bug, which means they have a piercing sucking mouthpiece. So what they will basically do is it's kind of like a big bendable straw. They will stab it into the tomato. They will release a little bit of their saliva and that will liquefy the tomato and then they'll slurp it back up. What this basically does is that saliva breaks down the skin area of the tomato that causes that yellow sunburst. And I'll be honest, I have eaten dozens of these sunburst tomatoes throughout my life. They are 100% still edible. They don't really reduce the shelf life by the time it's a bright red tomato. You can sell them potentially as B grades or they're great for doing like value added goods, but a consumer also doesn't want to pay full price for something that they think is damaged. So these I think are probably one of the hardest insect pests to control in your tomato fields because Again, it's not like a full on chomp, it's just a little suck. If they're feeding when your tomatoes are green, you're not gonna notice them until the tomato's red. And they fly. They're fairly mobile, particularly in their adult stages. So the common ones you're gonna find here in the Middle Atlantic is the brown marmorated stink bug, the green stink bug, um, and then the native brown as well. The good news is we do have some good stink bugs as well. So if you are checking and scouting your tomato plants and you come across these guys, so this is the two spotted stink bug. Notice he's got the two spots up here. Um, you'll also find them in an orangey color and a tan color, as well as this is the spine shoulder bug. And you can see he's got these nice pointy shoulders. These guys love to feed on other stink bugs. They'll feed on the nymphs and the eggs of other stink bugs, as well as other caterpillars and stuff like that. So if you find these guys in your field, you wanna leave them. But when it comes to stink bug management, um, there has been some studies that have shown that kaolin clay or surround works kind of nice to reduce their feeding. You wanna make sure you get it on the fruit more so than dousing like the whole plant. But again, it can be rather costly and anytime it rains, you have to reapply it. So I would make sure that as you're growing your tomatoes, you keep a running list of what your costs are so that you can go back and reevaluate whether or not this was cost effective. When we talk about integrated pest management and sustainability, a lot of us always think environmental first, but if your business isn't paying for itself, it's not a business at that point, it's a hobby, which is great. You can be a hobby farmer, and that's fantastic. But if you're trying to save money to put little Jimmy through college or pay a mortgage, you need to make sure that you know how much you're spending on various things. So it might be one of those things where you say, okay, kale and clay, which is about $50, I think for like a 25 pound bag when I priced it out. And to do an acre, it's going to cost you about a hundred dollars. I think when I looked at it, now, if you buy it in bulk, you might get it at a cheaper rate. 
Um, but when I looked at it, I think that was what I found via Amazon. But I'm sure if you go someplace else, you might be able to get it cheaper than just Amazon. But again, these are all things to kind of keep into consideration. Stink bug are not necessarily the most beneficial for predators with the exception of other stink bugs. Like you're not necessarily going to have like tons of praying mantises and tomatoes feeding on them. So for biocontrol, you really want to emphasize the parasitism of their eggs. So doing something like potentially putting like a strip of buckwheat or another tiny little flower in might be beneficial. Um, your normal pollinator habitat will bring in parasitic wasps, but it's meant more for the larger bees. So I would specifically look for a parasite or parasitoid more friendly mix. So something like buckwheat or those tiny little flowers are going to be a lot better to get parasitic wasps in to really get those eggs. Because again, if you can, so here's an egg mass down here, you can see with the nymphs. And if they're dark colored, that means they're parasitized. And if you had, you know, two nymphs coming out of this egg cluster of 20 instead of 20, well, that's 18 less stink bugs you now have to worry about. You can also use things like insecticidal soaps and oils for those of you who are doing organic. But again, stink bugs can fly. So there's nothing to stop them from flying out of your field and back into your field after you've applied those kind of chemicals. Okay, so another interaction one. So what do you guys think caused this damage? Okay, so I had to guess if a blight, wind, hornworms, okay. So uh, it is an older picture, so we can see that there's a healthy plant here, and we can see there's healthy plants behind this guy. I'm going to assume this was a picture from like the 70s or the 80s based off of the guy, way this guy is dressing. Um, but we definitely see these sort of deadish, wilty plants right now. So uh, plants will wilt whenever they don't feel good. So not enough water is a great guess. For wilted plants, with the exception of we're seeing that there's healthy ones before and after it. So if I had a row of healthy plants and everything after it was wilting, I might check to see if the water was getting down there. You know, maybe your drip line got clogged or maybe there's a big puddle here. So water is a good guess. Um, but what this really is, is some wilting diseases. And there again are probably like a handful of about five to six different wilting diseases that I could talk about, but we are sort of on a timeline. So I'm gonna only really focus on these two, which are the two most common ones I've come across, at least here on the Eastern shore. And the first one is bacteria wilt, which is this one. It's a soil borne bacteria that basically gets into the roots through either natural wounds or insect feeding on the roots or something like that. And it will gum up the vascular system of the plant you'll notice that your plant will start wilting, particularly those bottom leaves. And then all of a sudden through a course of a few days to a week, depending on your temperature, will suddenly kind of die. So again, if you weren't paying attention, you might just see, you know, you might not notice those bottom wilting leaves and it might be your plant kind of suddenly died overnight. But if you were to dig it up and cut, particularly down at that root, Thing, you would notice this dark, dark coloration here on your vascular system. And when you cut it, it's going to be kind of gummy and sticky compared to some of your fungal ones will also have this discoloration, but they're not slimy per se. The other one is Fusarium wilt. This is a fungal soil borne pathogen. And this one's kind of unique in that you'll get this yellow effect, but you're only going to get it on like half of the plant and then it will slowly spread. So at first you're going to see yellowing on half and then it's going to slowly spread. And again, it's pretty much the exact same thing. It's a fungal disease. It's in your soil. It's going to get into the roots through just natural either openings or wounds and then will slowly kill your plant. So the best thing that you can do is just like Guy and Andrea mentioned, is to plant susceptible or to plant 
resistant varieties. So here's a study that the Home and Garden Information Center did where here's your susceptible one and here's your resistant one. And you can see between the two, the resistant is still good and going. Um, you, if you are doing something like an heirloom variety and there's not a resistant possibility, you can do grafting, which is this. So this is when you take a root stock and you apply a topper to it. You can do this yourself, but it involves a pretty intense setup. So I recommend buying them. They are going to be significantly more costly than your normal transplants. I know there's a, a place down in North Carolina that will do this on a small scale, but you're definitely looking at two to three times the cost of plants than it would be for just a normal plant. But again, if, if that's what your specialty is, then kind of that's what you're gonna do. This is also another one where kind of that sanitation and prevention really plays in because if you get a plant that is diseased, the best thing you can do is rip it up. The longer it sits there, the more likelihood it's gonna to spread to other plants. And when you pull it out, you wanna to try to get some of that root bed as well. And this is not something I would recommend putting in your compost bin. Because if it goes in your compost bin and you don't turn your bin properly to heat up and you go and spread that compost, you could theoretically just be spreading this, these diseases further. And some of these diseases are specialized to solanaceous and some of them are general, meaning even if you spread it in something and plant it, a non-tomato, you know, non non-pepper, non-eggplant, it could still affect that crop. And the last thing you wanna do is infect all of your farm with these soil-borne diseases. Likewise, if you know that you have a field that has these and you are, say, using the grafting, you wanna thoroughly clean your equipment after being in that field. Because again, it's soil-borne pathogens. So if I have soil on my hose from hoeing, and, or you know my tiller for my tractor and then I go into a different field and I still have those soil particles there, I basically spread it. It's the same thing as weed seeds. So think of it, those same kind of uh, really good uh, sanitation practices are gonna come into play here. Okay, so here's our next one. So what do you guys think caused this damage? Okay, good. You guys, most of you guys got this one. So this is caterpillars. So here in the Mid-Atlantic, we've got a, a fair amount of variety of caterpillars that will get into them, but these are probably the three main ones that I've seen farmers report. So this is the tomato fruit worm, also known as the corn ear worm or the bolt worm. Um, this thing loves to eat everything and anything. It tends to eat the fruit. You tend to see these later in the season and not so much the leaves as the hornworm. Um, the good thing is that they are uh, cannibalistic, so you will only have one per fruit, but the bad news is by the time it's done this, this fruit is basically unmarketable. Um, you might be able to cut the eating part off and feed your own family with it, but most food safety things would justify that you wouldn't be able to even use that for value added. So Guy already touched on the hornworm, but this is what it is. You can see they've got the little horn here. I generally say um, if the threshold for these is, again, if you're gonna scout your field and you're gonna count how many you find and then you're gonna average them per how many plants you counted. And if you have more than one per plant, you wanna go ahead and treat for them. And that would be, again, using an oil or an insecticidal soap, uh, or potentially BT. I will say that when you have a caterpillar that's this size, and these guys get up to three inches, none of that stuff's gonna really work on a three inch caterpillar, okay? He's getting ready to pupate, it's not gonna work. You need to get them when they're tiny like these guys. Now, if you do come across one like this that's covered in the parasitized eggs, you can leave him, okay? He is, he might be doing a little bit of munching still, but he's not going far or doing much. Particularly once these are on the outside, what happens is the wasps lay their eggs inside of the caterpillar. The eggs hatch and the larvae of the wasp 
eat the internal organs of the caterpillar. So he is really not feeling well. He's not really moving far or doing much. So at this point, you might as well leave him because all these cool wasps are gonna hatch out. Um, I will say if you, not so much this year um, because of COVID-19, but if you sell at a farmer's market and you have one or two of these guys on your table, you will have so many kids there looking at them. And it's a great way to draw kind of the public to your table. We had, I try to always get one or two when we do master gardener stuff at farmer's markets. And I always get some kids that are just fascinated by these. And again, it seems silly, but like, if little Jimmy is occupied by the caterpillar and mom can pick out her produce, she's more likely to probably get more produce at your table. So just think about it. And this last one here is the yellow striped army worm. You tend to find these again later in the season. They'll do some basic general feeding on there. The kind of the same protocol generally applies here. You can hand pick off, you can use, you know, BT, you can use sporosin. Again, if they're tiny, Things like the soaps and the oils may work on them, but again, once they get large, it's, it's basically hand picking. And I will say, particularly for the fruit worm, we do have the Maryland moth map. Um, we check the populations, particularly for sweet corn growers, using pheromone traps, so you can keep an eye on that, and if it gets high, that might be a good time to go out and treat your farm. Okay, so back, Back to your thinking caps, guys. What do you think caused this? And I will say this was a tricky, I did try to trick you guys. These are three different things. So, but we all kind of can group them together. And as an FYI, we've got about six minutes left for this. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, lights, fungus. Bottom rot, okay. You guys have gotten two out of the three. Okay, cool. Since we are running low on time, I'm gonna keep moving as far as, okay. Okay, so you guys got two out of the three. So this is blossom and rot off here to the left. So what this basically is, is you tend to get this early in the season, and this is a lack of specifically calcium, but sometimes it can be boron or some other micronutrient. And what happens is because the fruit is growing, the plant takes the calcium out of the bottom of the fruit and moves it to the top of the fruit as it expands, causing this sort of rot-like thing to form. You can do some things like add extra calcium sulfate to your soil and stuff, but I would really recommend, this is where having a good soil test comes into play. I've had farmers that have brought this in and said, I don't know why I'm getting this. I applied calcium sulfate. I applied all this other stuff. How is this still happening? And in some cases, it's, there's another micronutrient that's missing that the plant needs in order to break down the calcium. And sometimes it's a pH issue. If your soil is slightly acidic or slightly too alkaline, your plant may not be able to get that available calcium that it needs. Um, another option is I had a farmer who was strictly not irrigating. She was just using rainwater. And then your plant can't take calcium up if it doesn't have water. It needs water to take those nutrients up. So it, another thing could be, well, when's the last time you watered it? And this is Guy kind of touched on it, but I would emphasize that when you are doing watering, um, first of all, overhead watering is, is not good for tomatoes at all. I highly recommend using trickle tray for soaker hoses or what have you. But when it comes to watering, you want to do kind of longer waterings less frequently. So like if you were going to water for 30 minutes every day, I would encourage you to consider maybe watering an hour every other day instead, because what that's going to do is make your plants have to put in a deeper root system. And that deeper root system is going to help them get more of the micronutrients that they need. So the other guess you guys had was fungal things. And that's what this one over here is. So this is arachnus fruit rot. And this is another one of those uh, soil diseases that loves basically everything 
if you are growing tomatoes on some place that had strawberries repeatedly, I guarantee you will have them. Um, this is one that is in the soil. It doesn't come up through the roots, but it gets splashed up onto fruit. So doing things like, you know, Guy had in that high tunnel where they pruned out so none of the fruit was close to the soil is good. Um, again, using that drip take instead of overhead irrigation can also really help on this. I will say whenever you have plant fruit that is like this, go ahead and pick it off, particularly early in the season if you are not balancing a whole bunch of other stuff because your plant's gonna still spend time and energy making this fruit and none of this is sellable to you. Um, pretty much, so things like blossom end rot and sun scold, which is this metal one, can go in a compost bin. Um, if you've got pigs, you can feed them to pigs as well. I get hesitant about putting diseases in compost bins because again, if you're not turning them properly, they don't always break them down. So I would recommend in, on your farm, if you have a good compost bin that you're actually using, and then someplace in a wooded area, just cut, make what I call a rot pile, which is where you just throw all this. It's a natural setting. The deer can eat it, the birds can eat it. Everything could just rot there. Maybe you turn it every, you know, it's the last thing you turn in fall or something like that, but you're never actually gonna use it as compost in your ballot field. So this middle picture here is sun scold, and this basically happens when your leaves don't shade the tomato long enough and it gets basically it's equivalent to a sunburn and it'll get this leathery kind of tan look to it and it can potentially lead to rot and other fungal diseases. Okay and since we're running low on time I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that all of these are environmental issues. So again I get a lot of people who send me pictures of stuff and they go what kind of disease is doing this to my tomatoes? Well in these three cases, none of these three came from a disease or a bug. So this is similar to cat facing, and this is basically an issue with regards to pollination or a micronutrient. Um, this middle one is cracking, and this is when the plant takes up way too much water faster than it can actually grow the tomato for. And that's basically, it's just bursting and cracking. And then this last one is called zippering, and this is another one that happens when it has um, uneven pollination and or the flower just doesn't separate. So in the case of things like the cracking, again, this can go into a compost pile. These other ones, again, perfectly edible if you or your family wants to eat them. And again, I think they're really neat ones to have on a table, particularly if you are interacting with the public, because they're just neat looking. You may not sell them, but you could have a stack of them there that kids could look at or something. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to kind of teach the public a little bit about what you do. And people like that. People like to know more about their food and where their food comes from. It's one of the things I think a lot of people um, before COVID-19 and hopefully after will go to farmers markets to engage with you guys as farmers. And this kind of gives them something neat to do. So with that, um, again, there's my email address. So you guys have it. I will say um, we do have a plant diagnostic lab at University of Maryland Extension. It is currently closed because it was not deemed um, critical, unfortunately, which is really a letdown because uh, the people who run it should have been essential employees. But you can send them in pictures this year and then hopefully once this is over, they will open it back up. You can mail in plant samples to them. Uh, I would recommend if you are going to mail them in a disease sample that you contact your local ag agent. If I send Karen Rains, the lady who runs it, if I send her an email saying, I have a farmer sending you a tomato sample, she knows that it's coming and she knows to make it a priority. She gets a lot of homeowner samples as well, so sometimes she has a hard time weeding them out. I will say when you are mailing in a sample, she is going to ask you to mail in basically like whole plants or half plants. Um, whenever you are coming across something like this, do not be scared to remove parts of your plant. As long as they are higher than your knee, you can take off a fair amount of a plant and it will still grow as long as it's healthy. And if it's not healthy, you taking off half of a plant to figure out what's wrong with it isn't going to really harm it that much because at that point, it's probably not going to yield that much. And I think that's all I got to say. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Emily, as ever. Uh, really great information and great visuals and thanks for the interactive bit. It's fun to have that. 
Um, okay, so um, were you planning to stick around for the Q and A, Emily? Yeah, I will. And I have all of those resources. Um, I will go ahead and post those links in um, the chat. I'm just going to do them as like sections, though, so it's not like a huge block. Sweet. Thanks. And then um, I'll. And I'm assuming it's okay for me to include your slides with yep. the recording. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I'll definitely share those. Um, Okay, so um, there were a lot of really great questions that were coming up throughout the whole webinar and want to make sure that we get the chance to answer some of them. Um, so let's see, uh, where to start so many? Um, well, why don't we start with Guy, if you could explain the whole single, single leader pruning approach that you take and a couple of specific questions related to that were how often do you prune for a single leader? And um, do you use determinant versus indeterminate tomatoes? Does that um, change how you use your pruning approach um, as well? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, we, I think I mentioned in the, in the presentation, we, we are using indeterminate varieties um, <clears throat> in this particular system. Um, because those are the ones that are going to continue to grow and produce over a long season, um, really taking advantage of the um, limited space in a high tunnel to get as much value out of it as possible. Um, the, um, the frequency that we're pruning or pinching out um, suckers or side shoots in order to maintain that single leader um, is, is really as, as often as possible. Um, you know, it can be a really a bear of a task if you let it go too long and then you have to come back in and, and really work hard to clean up the plants. Whereas if you do a little bit every day, it, it goes by pretty quickly during the day and then it's easier in the long run. So, you know, it's kind of like one of those things where I just have to get myself in the, in the mode of like coming in in the morning and it's the first thing we do. And we run through and we just pinch any new suckers. There's not gonna be that many new ones that come on every night um, and we just get it done and then we move on to the next thing. It might take 45 minutes. But you know, if you let them, if you let those suckers start to grow where they're branching and it's pulling the plants down, which means that you know clipping is going to be more challenging. You know, you you wind up spending hours in there, um, and it, you know, spending hours in a tomato tunnel in the summer is really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now there was also a question about the single row versus double row planting mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so on a narrow bed, say if I was running the beds the length of the tunnel and um, I'm limited on my bed width to like say 36 inches or something like that um, while maximizing the number of rows in the tunnel, I might only really be able to place a single row of plants down that bed um, so that, you know, I'm allowing for enough space between individual rows between the beds to get in there and do crop maintenance and harvesting. On the um, lateral bed system where our beds are spaced not 36 inches apart, but are spaced five feet apart, um, I can actually put two rows of plants down the middle of that bed and they're they're going to be spaced anywhere from six to 12 inches apart and as i said they're going to be they're going to be staggered right so one row will start here the the next row beside that is going to start in between where the two plants in the first row are going to be um, and because there's so much space between the centers of these beds you know, it, it allows for me to have the, the, that two row system. It, um, it's not like necessary, but it's just something that I've done in order to cr increase plant population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, 
Another question that's come up a couple of times is, uh, so for Andrea, what happens when the tomato plants exceed your post height? Uh, how do you handle that? Yeah, so a um, couple different things with that. Um, the short answer is nothing. <laughs> um, because I've, uh, I've done sometimes where like, oh, they reach, you know, that like five foot level, let me, you know, cut off all the tops of the plants to like limit the growth and stuff like that. And I find that the plants don't really care for, you know, kind of adversely affects the plants and what ends up happening once they kind of go past the stakes, which, you know, follow this up, it really actually doesn't really happen. But if they do start to reach the top of the stakes, they'll kind of just start to grow further over, but you don't really have that much growth at that point because the uh, maturity level of the plant, now it's putting all its energy into fruit production and it's, you know, kind of aging, aging out. One of the reasons that my plants um, don't, you know, they kind of reach that height, but they don't really grow over is because I definitely give my tomatoes some tough love. Um, but Guy mentioned the way that he does irrigation in the, um, in the tunnel and that's similar to how I do mine. So obviously I'm outside and like it rains. Um, but if I am doing irrigating, I'm giving it a really big drink. I'm letting it dry out between that. And then once fruit production, once I have that first ripe tomato on the entire bed, I will not irrigate that bed again. Now, obviously it's gonna, you know, we're gonna have rain and stuff like that. And that type of method I started doing in California where it doesn't rain in the summer. And so you might say like, well, how can a plant survive without, you know, water for a week or whatever? I literally would not irrigate my tomatoes starting like in July until we got rain again in like October, November, and they're fine because you have created a very deep root system. They can get what they want. You're not eating the leaves of the plant, you're eating the fruit. So personally, I don't care how big the plant is, I'm looking at fruit production. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a long answer. That's great, and actually, so this is a good time to follow up, um, and maybe you can both answer it since your scenarios are different indoor and outdoor with watering. Um, how often and for how long do you water your plants? So I know, Andrea, you've said, you know, you don't water them for certain parts, but how do you approach yeah. the part when you do So water? the way that I um, plant my tomatoes is I put out the drip tape first. I kind of mentioned in my presentation that I'm, I'm spacing. I'm actually using my drip tape for my measurement. So I have my drip tape line out on the bed and I turn it on and then I'm, then I'm planting um, every 24 inches. And so everything is getting a nice big drink. They are also well um, water plants before they go in. Um, I will then leave that water on when they trans are transplanted, um, kind of the whole time I'm out in the field, or if it starts to puddle up, I'll turn it off. But I really want there to be, you know, a lot of, a lot of water. And then, um, you know, we've been getting rain and stuff. So at this point, let's see, I transplanted my tomatoes like two weeks ago. I really haven't turned on the irrigation again right now because we've been getting rain. Um, but I will, when they're smaller plants, um, if rain isn't so much of a factor, I will be irrigating them like two or three times a week for, a you know, um, one to three hours with the drip tape on. I have clay soil. If you're in a sandy soil situation, that might have to be more frequent. But like Emily said, you're better off doing a very long period of time as opposed to like 30 minutes every day. And then as the plant um, grows taller, I start to limit it. So if I was watering it three times a week for two to three hours each, then after another two or three week period, I would bring it back to like twice a week or once a week. And then, like I said, when that fruit 
that first ripened fruit happens on that bed or where, however my irrigation is set up, I turn it off and I don't water them again. Awesome. And what's your approach, Guy? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Andrea mentioned this a little bit, but I cannot emphasize enough how critical it is to do that initial deep watering immediately after planting. I mean, when you're transplanting, you're, you're obviously going to want to soak your transplants. Um, you know, if you're pulling them out of pots, it makes it a lot easier. But you want to have like adequate moisture in the root ball. Um, <clears throat> and it, 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 it reduces transplant shock. But you want to water in those tomatoes deep and make sure that your bed is like has, you know, like the capacity of moisture that it needs. And then, um, yeah, while the plants are growing on um, after transplant, before they're fruiting, you might water a little more frequently because you're just trying to, you know, get that plant to put on as much growth as you can. Now, once I start getting fruit, I'm definitely going to water less frequently and I don't need to water as frequently because at that point, ideally, this plant has already put down deep roots. But what I would, what I tend to do is um, maybe once a week, um, you know, after a harvest where I've like really like done a hard harvest and gotten all of the ripe or close to ripe fruit off the vine, um, I'm going to do a nice deep watering and that'll actually encourage like the next round of fruiting. Um, <clears throat> now you can do like, I mean, certainly like the, the mid-Atlantic commercial vegetable production guide is going to have recommendations about this. So you can approach it from a quantitative perspective, but I don't, I don't know many farmers that do that. I usually kind of make a qualitative assessment. Do the plants look like they need water or, you know, maybe I'm going to put my hands into the soil and see how far down I have to go before I hit you know, good moisture. I mean, it's totally fine if the top like three to four inches of soil are dry as a bone with these tomatoes. In fact, it's going to really improve your weed control, right? But um, yeah, uh, it's just kind of, you know, get in there, put your hands in and, and see what it's like and make it make a decision. And as you, you know, as you go through the process year to year of growing tomatoes, you're making the decision, you, you're taking an action and you're going to observe what happens and then you're going to have the, you know, you're going to be able to make a better decision the next time. So that definitely prefer and promote the qualitative style of farming. Mm -hmm. It's an yeah. art. I see Andrea smiling. Thank you. Totally agree. Um, uh, okay, that's awesome. Definitely a lot of re um, responses in the chat box that that was really helpful information. Let me see what else I can pull up. Um, as an FYI, um, I'm going to launch this last poll now. Um, so how do I do that? Hold on one second. I should have two people. <laughs> it's hard to ask questions and do that stuff at the same time. Um, relaunch. Nope, don't need to do that. Okay, stop that. Well, anyway, I'll try to ask the question and then figure this. I'll ask a question and then I'll figure out the launching the next poll. Um, okay, so let's see what would be a good one to touch on real quick. Any experiences with tomatillos or ground cherries and do they need similar trellising? I can speak to that a little bit. So um, tomatillos uh, grow a little bit differently than tomatoes. They kind of branch out more like a tree-ish, but I have planted them in the same row with tomatoes and done the trellising down there. Um, ground cherries probably do the same thing. It's been a number of years since I've grown ground cherries, but um, tomatillos do benefit from having some support. Otherwise, they'll kind of spread out on the ground and you'll have um, airflow issues. A uh, word of caution. <clears throat> I grew, I, I have ceased growing tomatillos or ground cherries because uh, I, I don't really have the ability to market them. Our chefs aren't really into it on campus. Um, I grew them because students were interested, but um, you know, even way more than tomatoes, 
uh, in terms of problems that you can get from fruit that is left on the ground, tom tomatillos and ground cherries can become a nightmare weed in future seasons if you don't really like fastidiously clean up stuff that um, falls to the ground, especially the ground cherries, which aren't really like, they like kind of need to ripen on the ground. So, you know, I haven't grown tomatillos in probably four seasons and I'm still having to do like three or four weedings a year in the bed where those tomatillos were because I didn't clean it up. Now they're easy to kill as a weed, but it's still like just annoying to like always have to look at these tomatillos. And there was a question about pruning either of them. Did you guys mention that? Um, I never really bothered to prune the tomatillos or the ground cherries. Um, like I said, they don't, ex they don't exactly grow just like a tomato, like, you know, as far as the structure of them, they don't get as tall either. Okay, cool. So then the next question we can go to, um, let's see, so many. Um, on a similar tip with thistle, have you guys ever had uh, any issues with that as a weed? And if so, how did you handle that? And maybe Emily too, if you have any thoughts um, on that. <clears throat> Can I answer this question? Of course. <laughs> All right, so it, it depends. Um, if you have like a few like ornery thistle plants that are out there, just go out and, and dig them up. I mean, you know, take a sharp spade, run it in at an angle and get the root as deep as possible and use gloves and get rid of it, you know, and I think if you do that, you're, you know, kind of what I call roguing, getting the rogue weeds, you can control that pretty well. I do that with like dockweed. I do that with, um, um, you know, just the kind of like big weeds, perennial weeds that tend to come back every year. Like if it just, just get the spade out and, and kill it. Now, if you have like a carpet of Canadian thistle and you cannot you know, meet, like reasonably weeded out mechanically, you really have to think about chemical control. It's probably more ecological to do it that way than it would be to go through the, the kind of radical process of like digging up all the soil that you need to do, you know, like disturbing the soil as often as you would have to in order to kill that Canadian thistle. Whereas there are herbicides out there that really like their effectiveness is, it, it, it affects the plant and nothing else. I mean, obviously you need to apply it under, you know, according to the label and following safety precaution, but you can terminate those weeds very quickly without causing a lot of adverse effects to the ecology, you know, the ecology of the area that you're that you're working in. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have the same approach when it comes to like uh, invasive trees, for example, or like wisteria. Like probably, like it's much more disruptive to go in with a backhoe and dig out those trees and doing it organically mm -hmm. than it would be to you know hack and squirt, you know, get a little herbicide into underneath into the um, bark of the tree. So that would be my approach to thistle. Now, I haven't personally had to deal with a lot of thistle issues. So I really like, I'm not speaking from a lot of experience here, but that's the way I would think about it if I had a problem like that. And that's great. And would you mind if you could in the chat box, somebody was asking um, the herbicide of choice. If you type that in while you're doing that, I wanted to recognize somebody else in the chat box said, or if anybody can answer that, not specifically you. Um, uh, somebody had mentioned that if they had the ability to rotate that um, part of their field out um, for a period of time and they did cover crops uh, in that section. If that person is still on the line, would you mind unmuting yourself and just sharing a little like two minute, one minute um, response so that we can ask or answer one or two more questions? Um, 
if you're there. I just thought that was a really good point. Yeah. Uh, if they're not, I can always talk about it. But yeah, feel free to go for it, Emily. Maybe that person's not here. So this is something that we've come across um, a little bit more in pastures um, than so, but yeah, so if you have a really bad outbreak, um, particularly if you are organic and you can't necessarily use uh, an herbicide because then it, it basically voids your organic certification, one thing you can do is rotate that section of your field out um, and you can use some other sorts of methods to kind of do it. So, you know, uh, constant mowing, kind of to knock it back and then putting down a really thick, heavy cover crop in the fall. So something like vetch or clover and rice. So like doing a big multi kind of species mix just to literally outshade it might be a good way. I honestly don't work with that much thistle, but we've got some other like resistant earth weeds out here that that's kind of been one of the things we've been dealing with palmer amethyst in some of our fields you can also potentially switch it over to something that even if you want it to still use it for crops maybe something like corn might be a better one to do again especially if you could do like a green planting of corn so if you had thick stand of like crimson clover and then could put corn into it you know you still might be able to use it for something but I would say if it's really bad and you can't necessarily use an herbicide to treat it, you may need to take it out of production for a year or two just to really get at it. That being said, um, Palmer amethyst in your field as well would be another one that like you want to nip that in the butt quickly because that can spread and take over very, very fast. So ideally, even if you have a patch and you have rotated out and you're kind of like, well, I'll deal with it later. Do not let it go to flower because if it goes to flower and it drops seeds, you will be battling it next year twice as bad. And that stands for any weed. So if any weeds you have, even if you're like, well, I can't get around to spraying them, mow them down before they go to flower. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and controlling your weeds is a great way to control your insect pests too. So it seems one of those things where, oh man, I don't have two hours to to weed around my field, find that time to do it because honestly, it will cut back on a lot of your other pest issues. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to chime in, Guy? Yeah, I do have a follow-up uh, recommendation, um, uh, which just occurred to me, which is you could also potentially try occultation, which is a fancy term for um, blocking out sunlight. And so there are some good products out there that can help you do that. Um, commonly referred to as silage tarp, which is like a heavy grade <clears throat> um, polyethylene um, film that's similar to like greenhouse plastic, but it's white on one side and black on the other. And if you place that on, <clears throat> on a plot with the white side down, it does a really good job of blocking out like 100% of sunlight. So it will eventually kill all um, uh, plants that are underneath of it and um, actually works fairly well as a temporary mulch. Um, and I use it in some <clears throat> parts of our rotation on turf farm, um, particularly what, like with late season crops that I don't, um, don't really have enough time to get winter covers in afterwards um, to kind of protect the soil through the winter. And whenever I pull it up, it's just like an earthworm party. So you know, it, it it's at first I was like, well, I feel kind of bad about like sealing off the, gr the, the ground with this giant sheet of plastic, but um, the soil quality underneath of it when I pull it off and the absolute like complete lack of residue, plant residue on the surface um, <clears throat> has actually been really nice. So that could work for um, uh, an outbreak of um, of something like thistle, but you would want to apply that when it's really young, because I think if it's if it's already stalky, um, one is you're obviously going to have to mow it before you put the tarp down um, and risk spreading anything around. And then the other problem is, is it probably will tear the tarp. 
even even a, a heavy grade piece of plastic like that and then if if light gets through then you've you, you know it's it's not going to work so um yeah. that's something to try i will say if you are going the non-organic route and you are using an herbicide follow the label but Applying an herbicide, particularly on something that has a deep tap root, works really well if you apply it in the heat of the summer and into the fall. Um, so if you can't get weeds when they're tiny and you've got to kind of battle them, so you can do the mowing. And then if you're doing something like August time is a great time to kind of hit them up because August into September, they're cutting back on foliage and they're trying to store up for winter, particularly if they're perennials and that's when you can kind of kill those deep tap roots of your perennial weeds. Sweet, thanks for those tips. Um, so we had this scheduled until 1.15 so we can squeeze in one more question and uh, if there's time we can maybe do one more but um, we just have a little bit of time left. One of the questions that came up and maybe all of you can speak to it or whoever wants to hop on feel free um, how do you remediate boron deficiency and can it be done via foliar spray? Um, so, I mean, I get a soil test done every year and it'll show that there are, you know, kind of low levels of boron and I will add that boron into the mix of things that I add to prep my field um, in the spring. So that is I have never tried to apply boron after the fact when I have plants already growing. And if anybody wanted to add something, Guy, did you want to? Um, I, <clears throat> I've done it both ways. Um, currently, I don't actually have a convenient way to apply like a granular fertilizer, um, which, you know, the, the I guess granulated or on what I can't remember what the product is called, but um, it, it it gets applied in such small amounts. It's like one pound per acre. It's it's hard to apply. Like if I had a, <clears throat> I could probably do it in the high tunnel, where I'm like basically just slinging on fertilizer by hand. Um, but I have also used um, a liquid product before, and I just use it in place of. Because uh, it, it, it does have like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium in it as well, in addition to the boron. And following the label, I just basically use that in place of fish emulsion as my seedling fertilizer. So it's just getting a, a dose of, of that boron. I, it's impossible for me to really know if it's making a difference other than, I mean, I'm growing like cocktail tomatoes, which don't really have the kind of issues that like heirlooms do with boron deficiency, or at least it's not obvious. But um, I also use it on beets, which also tend to require the heavy boron feeders. Um, so. Awesome, thanks. So, um, oh, Emily, like, yeah, go for it chime in to make sure that you have done a soil test um, and that you are taking note of the pH because boron is one of those ones that is finicky with pH. Um, if they want to send me an email, I can try to find them um, some extension stuff about boron and like what to, what to apply. I know some can be done fuller and some can be ran through like mixed in with water and ran through like a drip tape. I just don't recall off the top of my head what they are. So shoot me an email um, and I can get you some resources on that. Awesome, thank you. Um, ooh, okay, so one, one other question real quick, Guy, uh, in growing tomatoes in a high tunnel, do you use shade cloth? Um, you know, how, is that something that you've dealt with? <clears throat> Personally, I've never used shade cloth. I will say that the, um, <clears throat> The extension vegetable specialist that's uh, based in Upper Marlboro, Dr. Brust, has done a lot of um, trialing with, uh, with shade fabric. Um, he has found that uh, it is actually not 
beneficial in a high tunnel or at least hasn't shown any sort of like commercial benefit, financial benefit. And that may be due to the fact that the tunnel film itself is already providing that like low level amount of um, light blocking that, that the plants seem to enjoy. Um, and you don't really like, I find you don't really see a lot of sun scalding in high tunnels, at least in the, <clears throat> I, I see it more later in the season. I don't know if it's because the fruit walls are thinning or what, what the case may be. Now on outdoor tomatoes, um, Dr. Bruss's research has shown that there is some benefit to using shade cloth but um, it may not be practical because uh, you know you have to go out there and remove it to harvest and then put it back on. And the, the main benefit, I mean, really what he said is that, um, you know, it just depends on like the varieties that you're growing, like varieties that have like larger leaves that are, sh that are shading the fruit and also shading the ground are gonna perform better than ones that have spindly leaves. Um, but then again, like most of the spindly leaf varieties are like cherry tomatoes, which aren't suffering from the same kind of, you know, like scalding issues that that large beefsteak or heirloom tomatoes might suffer from. So, you know, you can do it on, if you're doing it on a small scale. Yay. You know, your home garden, try it out. But I think it's not something that a lot of farmers are going to adapt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see uh, Andrea shaking her head in agreement. Um, okay, so um, if I, there were more questions, we didn't get to all of them, and I apologize about that. Uh, I guess, is it okay for people to email you if they have like a burning question? Yeah, okay. Um, and then it, I yeah. guess also if, um, if there's like one really burning question that you just have to ask right now before you're doing this like next thing in your field, um, feel free to put it in the chat box or unmute yourself um, <laughs> for the last minute. Just want to make sure there's nothing like really pressing that doesn't get answered. Maybe nothing is super burning. Um, well, I'll echo what I'm seeing coming up in the chat box and have been seeing for the last, you know, five to 10 minutes. Just great job. You know, thank you guys so much. This was an amazingly informative um, and precise and helpful webinar. Um, you guys are awesome. And everybody who joined, thank you so much for joining and good luck with the season. We hope your tomato harvest goes really well. Um, I'll be sharing the webinar um, link with you guys with the slides so you'll have access to that and you'll have everybody's email addresses. Um, so a big round of applause to um, Andrea, Guy, and Emily. Thank you so much for sharing your information today. Thank you. I wanted to mention that in the, in the poll that you took, the square where you were supposed to pick what you're growing, it said choose all that apply. You could only choose one. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Somebody else um, sent me a message about that, too. My apologies. I'll definitely make sure to change that, um, fix that for the future. Thank you for flagging it because um, I will fix it. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody, and um, best of luck till the next time. <laughs>